when the time came, everybody suddenly realised that this very important man coming to Europe was going to visit Dungan Cell in Euros. But well, there was great excitement when he was coming, like, you know, because there, nobody spoke about anything else. Looking up at the ceiling or up at the wall with a photograph of the Pope and Kennedy beside him. So it was all about Kennedy. 165 years ago, Patrick Kennedy, a farmer from Dungan's town, New Ross County, Wexford, would board the Dunbrody ship in the port of New Ross to escape the effects of the Great Famine, as so many did, to seek a better, although unknown life in the New World. Little did he realize, as he sailed down the river barrel for the very last time, that three generations later, his great-grandson would return to his family homestead, not as a farmer, nor as a cooper, as Patrick would come to be in his adopted Boston, but as the leader of the free world, and unarguably the most important person on the planet. President John F. Kennedy's visit to New Ross in June 1963 would last a mere 45 minutes, but would leave a lasting impression on the social fabric of this small riverside town that is still prominent 50 years on. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Uh, but before a son can return home, the son must first leave hearth and heart. Sean Reedy, CEO of the JFK Trust in New Ross, recounts Patrick Kennedy's journey to Boston in 1848. You know, the potato crop did fail here, and people were struggling. Patrick Kennedy was out in Dungan'stown. Things weren't going too well, and he decided he'd head off to Boston. So I, I imagine, you know, leaving the family home in Dungan'stown was a big wrench for him. He, he um, came into New Ross. There is evidence that he actually went on to Dunbrody from here to Liverpool, and then he got on a ship called the Washington Irving, which brought him from Liverpool to Boston. He married Bridget Murphy, who had been living on the other side of Sleeve Kylte in Gosseran, and obviously they knew each other. They didn't travel on the same ship, but like a lot of Irish at that time, they congregated in, in groups in, in cities in America, and people came out who knew that there was a group that would welcome them and look after them when they arrived. So Patrick and Bridget then got married and um, they had five children and Patrick died within nine years of arrival. So Bridget raised the family, you know, the history of the Kennedy family goes from her obviously doing a very good job in raising five children and her son PJ was probably the one who started the rise of the Kennedy family. But life would dramatically change in three generations. The world would experience several untold wars and atrocities, make rapid advancements in transportation and telecommunications, and even develop the capacity to destroy the planet. It was a precarious time in the early 1960s, and hardly appropriate for a U.S. president to make a sentimental journey back to his ancestral home. Retired professor of modern Irish history, Dr. Louis Cullen, a native of New Ross, explains why it was so important for JFK to visit Ireland, and especially New Ross. Well, the Kennedys, partly for electoral reasons, attached importance to their Irish origins. And it was also, of course, picked up uh, from the New Ross end by Andy Minahan, uh, who really was a big figure on the landscape uh, in uh, New Ross in the 50s and 60s, and became a big figure on the national one, uh, you know, in the context of Kennedy uh, coming. The relationship between Kennedy and Andy is very interesting because Andy didn't lack confidence and hence even a president was just the equal uh, to a new Ross citizen. Uh, I think he was chairman of the, the town council was he in 63 uh, uh, so that you know that they were equals and he behaved as equals. He wasn't overawed by anyone and I think that of course impressed uh, that impressed Kennedy I suspect because uh, 
uh, he, he, you know, that, uh, he was dealing with a man who was totally sure of himself. So Kennedy's coming to Ireland is a very sharp contrast, for instance, with Kennedy's going to Rome uh, at the same time. Kennedy was in Ireland from the 26th of June to the 29th of June, 1963. And the you know the crowds were tumultuous. The only rival uh, would have been the Pope in 1979 uh, in scale. So it was extraordinary. Owen Minahan, son of the late Andy Minahan, who was chairman of New Ross Town Council in the 1960s, explains how his father fostered the relationship with a young, politically ambitious John F. Kennedy. When Kennedy was running for selection for the Democratic Party, my father was chairman of the council, but he wrote to John F. and said, whichever way the primaries go, and whatever, uh, we wish you luck in the primaries, whichever way they go, you're welcome to come to New Ross. And the third letter went at the day of the inauguration. It was a letter at this stage which was what we call an illuminated address. The illuminated address were the big things done in calligraphy, and, uh, um, and they were very popular at the turn of the century inviting him to uh, to come and saying congratulations etc and inviting him to come to visit the inauguration would have been in 1961 kennedy said at the time yes he would like to come to sometime to new ross the first tribute from the townspeople of new ross to the newly elected u.s president came on the very day of his inauguration at the same time that the inauguration was happening over in america there was a candlelight procession around New Ross. And that was organised by Andy as well, because they were very much into processions and, um, and parades and fireworks displays and all these sorts of things. We had all these things at different times throughout the 1950s, it, you know, on a shoestring. The visit of President Kennedy to New Ross, although flagged weeks in advance, wasn't confirmed until just prior to the actual event on June 27th. The town went to great lengths to prepare. Committees were formed to clean up the town, provide entertainment, and to coordinate the logistics of the visit. Chairman Andy Minahan was at the forefront of these preparations, as his son Owen explains. Having to deal with the, with the as they say, people from the embassy and people, military, military attaches, security people, uh, FBI, all sorts of people were were to the fore then because there was always the possibility, the great possibility that President Kennedy might be assassinated. There was one particular aspect when the ambassador came down and said, well, well, Mayor Milan, when is this, when are these mountains of stuff going to be moved? What are you going to do with these mountains of something, SH, something, five letter word? And uh, so what are you going to do with them? So anyhow, Andy was always in for the quick quip and he said, we're, we're getting 14 more mountains like that together and we're going to call it the Alps. Then all that stuff had to, was cleaned in the few days before, before the arrival of the president so that the place was spick and span. But making the town look presentable for the occasion was perhaps the easiest task. The vital high-tech telecommunication demands that would be necessary to accompany a U.S. president abroad would have to be upgraded to make the visit possible in the first place. When the president was going to come, you would also have to have the red telephone available all the time. And the red telephone was, if, if the button had to be pressed or whatever over in Washington, the president had to have a telephone with him all the time. So that meant the telecommunication down here had to be up to speed the autumn before the, the president came, we got the we got the new types of telephones down here, and they didn't appear in most other places in Ireland for another twenty years, and so we had the dial telephones down here, here and here in Waterford, so that the dialing could could take place. And remember, when he came here in June, he had just come from Berlin, where he had uh, where where the wall was being built and so all this Soviet uh, business was causing great problems at the time. There were other items that had to be done like manhole covers in the, in the, in the street had to, be, had to be welded down into position so that, so, that, so that there wouldn't be anybody taking a pot shot at the president. So 
all of that sort of thing worked in your ass and that and Kennedy would then in knew that when he came, or should I say, that it was just a friendly place to be near, near his relative. Jimmy Fitzgibbon is the current chairman of the New Ross Historical Society. His family operated a takeaway restaurant at the time of JFK's visit and fondly remembers the build-up to the big day. Oh, they were, the security was... There were pe- these people were coming in and, and they were doing things and, 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 and the people in town were saying, what the hell are they doing? I mean, this, there's nothing going to happen to this man here. I mean, he's going to have... You know, they, we never knew what security was. We, there were people up on roofs with guns and there was... You know, there was, I mean, security was very... very little did we know that there's... The, 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 uh, a few months afterwards, we were having our tea at home. I was just newly newly married, and, 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 and the next thing he came over the radio that, that Kennedy was dead, and the first thing we did came down and, clo- and closed the restaurant. The whole town closed up that night. Well, it was the busiest day of my life because that started off... I, I had a milk round in Europe at that time, and because of the security, I had to, to be off the town by 8 o'clock in the morning. And then we, we had a, a restaurant uh, in, 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 in town. We built a new restaurant, we just opened just before Kennedy came. And the night before the Kennedy's arrival, we got an order for a thousand sandwiches to feed the guards. So we had to, to, to we travelled the country to get sliced pans and ham. <laughs> ham. It had to be ham sandwiches, a thousand, and have them ready for, 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 for a collection to feed these hundreds of guards that were coming to, to, to protect the president. May Franklin who was 22 at the time, describes the atmosphere of the town as it prepared for the special event. Oh, God, excitement, uh, Elizabeth. Oh, there was great excitement when he was coming, like, you know, because there, nobody spoke about anything else. And it was either President Kennedy or to be, like, uh, Dugganstown. Because that's where he was originally from. With over 200 newspaper, radio and television journalists expected to accompany President Kennedy, May remembers the efforts of the local townspeople to prepare New Ross for its debut on the world stage. Well, I suppose you put it this way, anyone could afford it. Uh, Painted up their houses and cleaned, they were washing and cleaning outside on the paths. And do you know the general thing when something special is happening? Oh God, they were, they were, re- I, I tell you what, there's a, a height of activity. The, the whole town for about a, a few weeks before he came at all, because it was, it was a special thing that really happened. Do you know that, that and it might never happen again, everyone would be saying. But like, and it didn't happen before that. Jim Sutton was a member of the FCA. He helped assemble the famous platform on the quayside where President Kennedy would address the people of New Ross as well as millions of television viewers from around the world. Well, my bit was, was, uh, I did a bit with uh, organising the the, the stage and the and so forth, that kind of stuff, you know. Fetching and carrying, I suppose, is the, is the, 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 the best name you could put on it. But I was there on the day, which was the which was extremely interesting. How long did it take you to build the stage then? Ah, not that long, not very long really. Uh, we had planks and barrels, so it was a kind of a, uh, a makey up stage, you know. There was a lot, of course, there was a lot of, yes, there was a lot of international press there, uh, probably a day or two beforehand. RT were there in, in, uh, uh, in force, uh, cameras and what have you, uh, reporters all over the place. Victor Furness, now a current member of New Ross Town Council, was an impressionable 13-year-old back in 1963. It was nothing else when you talk about the Kennedy. This icon coming to our town of New Ross. It was talked about everywhere, dinner, supper, going to bed at night time, looking up at a ceiling or up at a wall with a photograph of the Pope and Kennedy beside him. So it was all about Kennedy. You know, it was like uh, your first Holy Communion day. Everyone getting prepared for dressed up in your whites, going up, you know, you're going up to the park and you're going to sing for this wonderful person coming into our town. Uh, we didn't realise at 13 years of age what this guy meant to New Ross, but by God, when we saw him, he was the biggest thing we've ever seen coming in. I've never saw so many big cars in my time, and guys with big long coats on them. <laughs> I said, my God, what's going on here? And so, on the eve of JFK's visit, having followed his European tour thus far, and listened to his iconic Ich bin ein Berliner speech. The people of New Ross went to bed, but not to sleep. They knew they were about to experience something very, very special. 
something that would only belong to them.